welcome to the itinerary. Today's episode, we're exploring art tourism, which broadly covers travel for the sake of seeing and enjoying art in whatever shape or form it takes. It can be as simple as visiting a local gallery, driving out to a beautiful sculpture park, flying domestically for an art event, or traveling internationally to seek out the famed art and certain destinations. We have a fantastic range of people joining us to discuss this topic today. Anna Calva, General Manager of Marketing and Communications, Wellington, New Zealand, the Regional Tourism Board of New Zealand's Art and Culture Capital, and Kira Pratt, New Zealand Marketing and Communications Manager at Live Nation, which is bringing us some incredible global art events. Ladies, thank you so much for being here with us today on the itinerary. Now, the words art, tourism, automatically takes me to global places such as Paris with its incredible galleries and theatres. It's clearly an art destination. Can we consider New Zealand one of those art destinations and how is it that we even achieve that title? I think New Zealand is on its way to being considered an art destination. What we've seen in a lot of the exhibitions or productions we're putting forth is that we have really young, diverse audiences that are keen to engage with a range of experiences, whether that be alongside something more traditional or what we're tapping into with multi-sensory and interactive exhibitions and experiences. So I think we have a really engaged audience who just are hungry for more. Listen, I think if you take a narrow view of art, then no, I don't think people travel to New Zealand for those type of experiences and they, in the same way they might travel to Paris or Berlin. But if you think about art as just a essential part of culture, then yes, I think New Zealand has an incredible array of enriching cultural experiences that make it somewhere that people mm -hmm. uh, seek out for more than just our landscapes. You know, I think that our art and our culture is created by our people and we have a really interesting, diverse range of voices, as Kara said, and particularly our Māori culture, which makes um, those kind of artistic and cultural experiences really distinctive mm -hmm. and special for New Zealand. Uh, Anna, what can you tell us about the work that you and your colleagues do for Wellington, our major art city? Well, you know, really it is leveraging off what Wellingtonians do, you know. Wellington's kind of, I guess, place as a creative and cultural capital is defined by the people that have chosen to call it home. So we are actually the most creative region, not just city, but region in New Zealand as defined by the number of people that work in creative industries here. So so not only just purely the arts, but, and we've obviously got, um, I guess, hero art experiences and institutions like the Royal New Zealand Ballet and the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra, uh, but also how that goes across to uh, the private sector and into the, particularly the film sector uh, and technology, and I guess what you would consider that creative art that creative technology sector um, like Weta Digital, which has a lot of artists and Weta Workshop that has a lot of artists um, working for the film industry as well. So yeah, Wellington's it really is the people that have chosen Wellington and it just is a place uh, that draws a creative type of person. I personally think that's because sometimes our weather means that a lot of people are um, it's one quite an inspiring place, you know, and the, the really diverse and wild landscape is an inspiring place. And then you spend perhaps more time inside in Wellington than you might in um, climates uh, up right in the far north, for example. Uh, so I think that fosters a whole lot of creativity as well. But then in terms of what Wellington NZ does, um, we obviously, and Wellington um I guess as a community, there is lots of, I guess, funding and investment that goes into um, arts and events and making sure that they connect with a diverse range of audiences. But there is this stereotype around the fact that um, art or art tourism is, is for the slightly older generation or for the elite. Uh, what are your thoughts around this myth and how is it that we're going to myth buster this? <laughs> well, I think I can speak for several of the um, projects and exhibitions we have running now. Van Gogh Alive, that's a huge success story for New Zealand, one of the most, one of the world's most visited multi-sensory exhibitions. And what we're seeing 
is families and children interacting with the art of Vincent van Gogh, something you would normally see in a traditional art museum or art gallery. And we're telling that story in a new way and kids and families are really engaging with that. And even not even in a traditional sense, we have Happy Place, which is a modern pop art exhibition and that really caters to a social media generation. And so I think we're really challenging, in a sense, art tourism and what art can be across projects like that. But the great thing is, is that it's not just for the older generation. Yeah, I think that is, again, taking a narrow view of what art is. And I think typically just the word art can be sound quite elitist. But, you know, just look at what 660's done touring New Zealand. You know, 32,000 people went to the show at Sky Stadium in Wellington, and that was um, drew a lot of tourists from outside the region as well. Obviously, it filled Eden Park for the first music concert there. So, you know, 660 music is a form of art, um, as, mm -hmm. is, as is what you might see typically at a gallery. But even that, you know, that older, I guess what's known in tourism is that knowledge-seeking audience um, is, yes, there are certain types of older audiences who will spend more time in museum and galleries. But, you know, if just take a look at Te Papa and what they've done and really opening up to younger audiences with their Tataio Nature exhibition. Um, I took my kids there in the weekend. They were running around. You could touch things and play with things, get it right close to giant, you know, squids, take a shake in the earthquake house. So, yes, that's a cultural experience, but with lots of artistic um, ways that that has been delivered, working with local artists and designers. So I think you just need to shake off what you think, what, I guess, art is, and just open your eyes to the fact that really it is an inspiring, you know, art and in relation to tourism are inspiring, enriching experiences, and they really should be for all. And in saying that, Kira, these international shows and productions that you guys are bringing into New Zealand, how is it that you even bring them into New Zealand in the first place? I mean, that can't be an easy task. And um, is it an attractive area for these big productions to come into? It's a huge task for a huge dedicated team. And I think um, clearly it has been an interesting year for our industry um, in 2020. So we can look at things before where we would kind of, I guess, source content from international partners, source it directly ourselves in terms of artists, music, exhibitions, experiences, everything under the sun like that. And it's a huge team logistically sorting out freight, getting all the production staff together, building a really great team of contractors across the country and their skilled expertise and marketing the shows. So, it, I mean, they're months in an undertaking essentially, but a lot of dedication is involved. What is it that you foresee for the future of art? What is it that we can expect to see in the coming months, in the coming years? And also what type of direction do you think art tourism is taking for New Zealand and now and in the future? Really what we suddenly see is, is, is almost two different things. One is these amazing international uh, touring art shows that um, Kira has talked about, like Van Gogh Alive, you know, there's immersive multi-sensory experiences that help connect New Zealand with kind of international artists and international culture. So in Te Papa, for example, we're about to bring over uh, surrealist art, a major exhibition of over 180 masterpieces um, from all of the top surrealist artists in the world. But it's not just about international art is what we can expect. I think New Zealanders and New Zealand, you know, in relation to tourism and art and tourism, art gives and art experiences and events give us a chance to express our culture um, to each other and to the world. So I think we're going to see far, you know, an increasing amount of local amazing experiences, both in the immersive realm and in more traditional forms. We're going to see, I guess, the more mainstreaming of Māori art, which is wonderful, um, and people connecting with it, with our, you know, and really embracing it and as a way to learn about our, um, our own culture and our own history. So I think two things. One is, yes, still connecting with international art in new, exciting ways that embrace technology but also using art as a way to share our story 
with the world, which ultimately will attract more tourists to New Zealand. 2020 showed us that New Zealand audiences are hungry for diverse experiences that really challenge them, educate them, and ultimately what we're in the business of doing is entertaining. We can see that with Van Gogh Alive and in that space we're moving more. And I think we can see that with Happy Place and also The Lion King coming to New Zealand. That's a really amazing story that New Zealand is getting such an amazing show in an arena setting. So much like Anna said in terms of um, in terms of showing art in New Zealand, it's not just the traditional art, it's our music, it's our touring business. It's just basically what inspires people. So I think there's a huge area for New Zealand to move into. We're a destination that people want to come to and our audiences soak it all up. Let's wrap up the show today with one of our success stories and I'll see you all again in a couple of weeks. My name is Mark Kneebone, I'm the Managing Director of Live Nation New Zealand. I oversee the Live Nation group which includes venues, festivals, touring. We partner with Ticketmaster as well. Live Nation coordinates, produces, promotes everything from 50 person comedy shows through to sold out stadium shows. So we produce about 200 shows a year. We do a lot of family entertainment, a lot of comedy entertainment and of course a lot of music which is what we're best known for. But we also manage and run Auckland Spark Arena which is how the uh, whole Van Gogh conversation got started. Van Gogh Live is uh, the world's most visited multi-sensory experience. It's an immersive chance for people to be a part of the art, know the artist's story, but in a completely interactive new way. So we didn't want to build a gallery experience, we wanted something that people could bring their families to, experience art in, in something that they've never seen before, and turning the lights down and letting the images do all the talking. It's a product that's really designed for, or complements social media, especially you know, the sunflower room at the end. Van Gogh's had a huge impact for the New Zealand entertainment arts economy. We've sold over 250,000 tickets, which makes it one of the biggest sellers of all time for New Zealand. It's employed hundreds of people up and down the country. It's pumped money into suppliers, venues, ticketing companies, marketing. It's had a huge wider impact for the entire community and that's something we're really proud of. It's millions of dollars going out there to suppliers to keep them going as well as meaning that Live Nation can continue to grow our family and arts entertainment portfolio as well. It was also really reassuring to see Kiwis get behind something of this nature. It's not a sporting event, it's not a music event. You know, to have 250,000 New Zealanders go through a, an art exhibition in such a short amount of time is really promising and shows the potential there and maybe knocks down some of the stereotypes that we have together about what New Zealanders will and will not do on their weekends. So I look at art tourism as culture tourism, whether that's the ballet, whether it's art exhibitions. And I think that we're getting better at teaching New Zealanders that art is something you can go away for, it's something you can enjoy for the weekend, it's something you can take the kids to, it's something you can do for your 30th anniversary. You know, I think long gone are the days of, oh, we're gonna go to the All Blacks and that's the special night out. And there's nothing wrong with sport, I'm a huge sport fan, but I think the palette has been widened a bit there and that's something that's really, really important. I also look at events, you know, in Australia as well, you look at Vivid, you look at Monofoma, those incredible events that those cities have achieved and, and, and really taking on a life of their own now. And I'd like to think that we're starting to get there as Kiwis. There's some great creative things being put together and that encapsulates and gives platforms to young artists, musicians, dancers, chances for collaborations that wouldn't happen outside of that. My advice to any aspiring people who want to get into the arts industry is that it's all achievable. Curating at Brick Bay through to developing new artists or setting up a gallery or delivering 250,000 tickets for Van Gogh, whether it be music, dance, whatever your passion is, New Zealand is becoming that place now where there's enough of an industry that genuine career pathways are now established that you can find a way in and work your way up. You don't have to leave the country anymore. I'd like to think that the legacy of Van Gogh in Auckland is proving that the scale is available. It's there and projects like this can succeed. And I, I'd like to think that that encourages others to do so. Uh, I've no doubt that there will be other things of this size or, or attempted in the next couple of years. And I think that's great for New Zealand. I think it's great for Auckland and it's great for the wider industry as well because it keeps putting more money into those creative economies. And that's what we need if we're gonna grow our own stories and we're gonna grow our own people.